Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Libertarian Alliance. We meet every month, the uh, third Tuesday of the month. Monday. 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 Tuesday, the third <laughs> Monday of the month. Oh, I knew I'd get something wrong. This is entirely traditional, don't worry. Uh, What's your name? T tonight. Who's the Prime Minister? <laughs> Who's the Prime Minister? That's a bit of a tricky one. Well, it is indeed. <laughs> Uh, it's Boris while I speak, but it might not be while you're watching this. <laughs> but, uh, anyway, uh, 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 our speaker tonight is Dr. Sean Gubb, and he is going to talk on uh, corporate censorship. Dad, I'll hand it over to you. Oh, thank you, David. You normally give longer introductions, but thank you for that. Um, well, good evening. So many, so many old friends around the table, and one or two new ones. Uh, we were, I, I did originally suggest that I should talk about Islam, but um, it was suggested to me by various people outside this room, I think, that um, whatever I said about that subject might not be entirely well received. And so, and so I, I changed the topic at the last minute. Good evening. So, this evening, I will try to talk to you about corporate censorship, what it is, how it operates, and maybe what we should maybe we maybe what we should believe should be done about it. I'm not a founder member of the Libertarian Alliance, but I did join in December 1979, which makes me pretty pretty high up the uh, membership list. And back then, we all agreed, and David will correct me if I'm wrong, that the foremost violator of life, liberty, and property was the state. It was the state which had the power to kill us, to imprison us, to tax us, and to do all the other bad things in life to us. You may say, that this remains the case in the ultimate sense. But in recent years, what we have seen is the rise of what the title of this talk calls corporate censorship. This is a state of affairs in which the state subcontracts its work of censorship to private or to formerly private organizations, or indeed, the work of the state is even preempted by these private or formerly private organizations. Uh, as libertarians, we have an obvious answer to state censorship. W when you see a law requiring publications to register themselves uh, and to um, sign up to various codes of conduct, or when you see the police breaking into um, into people's door, breaking into people's houses because of what they've said or written, or when you see concentration camps, or when you see the Inquisition, all of these things, well, we are within our comfort zone as libertarians. We know that we're against it, and we know that the answer to this is simply to abolish it, to shut it down, to stop it from happening. But. When we see it done by these private or formerly private organizations, uh, I've noticed that there is a, a certain lack of clarity in our response. And I don't claim to have all of the answers. I, I don't even claim to have any of the answers. But I, I think it is a subject that is worth discussing, not just tonight, but worth discussing generally within our movement. After the, um, after the various disturbances in the United States that followed the election of Donald Trump, corporate censorship, which was by no means a new thing at the time, came suddenly to our attention. Um, you notice that, uh, that, that, that um, Facebook began shutting down pages. It, it began it began expelling its members. Twitter began monitoring posts or tweets. 
and um, again expelling people from Twitter and YouTube began a purge of um, videos that it considered to violate community standards and uh, more recently Amazon has been doing the same with books um, for, for a while David Duke the American what should I call him national socialist no white nationalist that's it David Duke the American white nationalist um, writer and speaker has had trouble with his YouTube videos and I believe Kevin McDonald another white nationalist in America has had some of his books removed from the Amazon platform people have lost their jobs people people are frightened to say what they really and truly think because they think it will come to the attention of their corporate employer uh, and they will lose their jobs. It, it's, long been, um, it, it, it's long been the fact that if you are a university lecturer or a teacher that your political views may get you into trouble, indeed may get you the sack. Chris Brand, now deceased, lost his job because of his um, because of his um, rather strong views on race and immigration and um, so it goes on what we to do you know, this is wrong most all of the examples I've given you so far are instances where people who are not libertarians it's not us it's people you can describe as Nazis, racists, anti-Semites, white nationalists, white separatists. Uh, you call them whatever you like. I, I, I don't insist on any particular names because I don't claim any particular right to categorise people outside my movement. But um, this has so far impacted entirely on a movement or a set of movements which is rather alien to our own. But I remember, I remember reading something by Nick Griffin many years ago who, said, who, who pointed out that virtually all of the state disruption piloted against his people in the late 1970s, the National Front in those days, that virtually all of the state initiatives against his particular movement were suddenly rolled out for the miners' strikes we used against the uh, flying pickets up and down the country in 1984, 1985. Uh, it, it is, it, it, I don't need to elaborate on the observation that if you want to shut down freedom of speech or freedom of association that the best place to start is with people who are so far outside the polite spectrum that they will have no one to defend them and then once the precedents have been set and once the various techniques of control have been refined they can then be used progressively against increasingly non-disreputable sections of the political spectrum uh, until eventually they become pretty well universal. Uh, and this may be what we're seeing with corporate censorship at the moment. Censorship carried out not by the state, but by organisations which are actually or formally separate from the state. Oh yes, now what's the... Oh, oh that's it. Uh, VDA, an, another American naughty organisation. Uh, let me see, VDA would describe itself as race realist, but you can call it white separatist, white nationalist, white supremacist, Nazi, racist. I, I, you know, don't, don't insist on any of those names. Some of them may be true, they may all be false. I, we don't take a particular line on that. But Vida a few years ago had its um, PayPal account shut down 
it, it violated the terms of service, i.e. It, um, it had principles with which the owners of PayPal disagreed. And I was looking at the BBC website earlier, which I'm afraid I do quite often at the moment because of a certain issue prominent in the news, which I think it's best not to discuss. <laughs> Um, there's an American fast food outlet called Chick Fil A. Chick Fil A. Chick Fil A. Chick Fil A. Forgive me. A U.S. fast food chain will cease trading at its first U.K. outlet amid a row over donations to anti-LGBT groups. Gay rights campaigners called for a boycott of Chick Fil A, which opened its first branch at the Oracle Shopping Centre in Reading on the 10th of October, that would be 2018. A spokesman from the shopping centre said, the right thing to do was not to extend the restaurant's lease beyond the six month pilot period. And so, and so what you have is an emerging or an actual state of affairs in which you have the formal right to say pretty well anything you like, but it is becoming very difficult to exercise those... No, I've got Thank you. Okay, uh, sorry. We have the legal right to say pretty well anything we like, you, you see, if I wanted to, and for the avoidance of doubt, I have not the slightest intention of doing so, if, if I wanted to, I, I could have spoken to you about why the Holocaust didn't happen or, and why it perhaps should have happened. And I don't think, even now, that would in itself be illegal. Uh, I, I could have denounced homosexuality. I could have denounced homosexuals as the scorn of Satan. And um, I might put into a spot of bother over that, but I don't think it's actually illegal to do so. You, you can in this country say pretty well anything you like. And if the authorities try to use the criminal law against you, they will eventually, I must admit after much, um, after much sweat and money has been expended on the Supreme Court, the authorities will eventually get a bloody nose. It's just that hardly anyone will do these things, not in a semi-open meeting, simply because, well, you'll lose your job, you'll lose your PayPal account, your books will be taken off Amazon, you'll be bounced off paper, you'll be bounced off e uh, sorry, you'll be bounced off um, Facebook and Twitter and so on. And this will probably get worse. Imagine a state of affairs in which cash has been abolished, and I don't need to elaborate on this, that there is a progressive abolition of cash. It's being abolished because it is old-fashioned, it is inconvenient, um, cash can be stolen, and uh, the authorities who don't particularly care about our convenience or the security of our property are also very keen on abolishing cash because it cuts down on tax evasion and um, it, it also allows the central banks to go about their strange monetary experiments without the chance of a significant leakage of money from the system. And so let's imagine a state of affairs in which cash will have been almost wholly abolished. At that point, every purchase you make will be logged. It'll be, uh, it'll be on the record. Now let's imagine, let's imagine someone, let's imagine, let's imagine a man called Richard Dragon, who is an extraordinarily evil man. He believes in cannibalism or, or something equally awful. And he's photographed by a, a group of concerned citizens coming out of Tesco with, with um, four big shopping bags. And this group of concerned citizens um, mounts a Twitter campaign against uh, Tesco saying, 
this organization does business with a hate-filled person. Um, to the point where Tesco will decide not to do business with this person. Uh, Mr. Dragon walks into his local Tesco and he's recognized because of the face recognition on the, on the surveillance cameras or he's noticed when he presents his card at the checkout and somebody comes up and says, I'm very sorry, Mr. Dragon, but it is company policy not to do business with people like you. W would you please leave your shopping on the floor and leave the premises at once? Yes, that, that may sound outlandish, but um, that is the direction in which we're going. And, and this, so far, has affected people far distant on the political spectrum from ourselves. We are libertarians or anarchists, we're conservatives, we are minimal status, classical liberals, again, call this what you will. Uh, we, we're within that part of the spectrum. And perhaps we don't need to worry what's done to some uh, Americans who don't like black people or Jews or something. But, but again, I do suggest that uh, when a precedent has been set, and when techniques of control have been refined, they will almost inevitably be extended to cover more and more of, of the spectrum and, and the area of what is entirely safe and reputable speech will be diminished. And although we're not next on the list of people to shut down, we may be somewhere on the list of people to shut down. And so what can we do about it? One of, the, one of the problems with this kind of corporate censorship is that it's private. And I, I, I won't refer you to any of the uh, blogs and postings uh, and even newspaper articles, but the obvious defense is Facebook is a private organization. It's owned by Mark Zuckerberg and the shareholders. And if they decide that people can only post while sitting naked in front of their webcams, it is their, it is their moral right to do so. It is wrong to interfere with um, their choice of, of whom they will associate with. And it's the same with Amazon. It's owned by Jeff Bezos and his shareholders. And if Mr. Bezos doesn't want to sell books by people whose views he abhors, then he has the absolute right to do so. As we ourselves have continually, continuously said over the years, the right to, the right to freedom of association includes the right not to associate. And if Mr. Zuckerberg and Mr. Bezos do not want to associate with certain people, and eventually may not want to associate with us, that is their absolute right. And to start talking about any legal measures to compel them to associate with people whose views they do not share is of exactly the same kind as those laws which have compelled Christian bakers to, to make cakes for gay weddings. And we are surely against that. So, yes, so, so what response can one give? I suppose the answer is that uh, the organisations, the organisations which carry out these acts of censorship are not usually private organisations. I've described them so far as formally private organisations. They are joint stock limited liability corporations. And these are not the same as entirely private enterprises. There, there was a time when there was a time when this could be an entirely abstract argument. I remember having the argument with Jack Wiseman at York in the 1980s. He, he's, he once grabbed hold of me when I was an undergraduate and said, so you believe in free markets, do you? And I said, yes, yes, I believe in free markets. And he said, so you don't believe in limited liability? And 
I don't just learn what limited liability was, but I said, uh, yes, of course I do, because it's part of the market. And he walked off with a curl of his lip. Quite rightly so, in my opinion now. If you are, if you set up a joint stock limited liability corporation, you are getting a group of privileges from the state which would not exist <coughs> in any market order or any natural order. But again, call it what you will. If I am the director of a limited company and my company is unable to pay its debts, the company goes out of business, the company is insolvent, but my personal assets are untouched because a limited company is regarded by the law as a person. That person is responsible for its debts. The person who owns and controls that company can walk away entirely free. Of course, when there is, uh, when there is strong evidence of fraud, then it is possible for the courts to lift the corporate veil and to grab the assets of the directors or the shareholders. But this is an extraordinarily rare occurrence. And in the normal course of business, when a company, when a company becomes insolvent, the shareholders and the directors do not lose any of their assets. I've heard people argue that um, in an entirely natural order, something like limited liability would emerge via the market because, or because businesses would contract with their creditors and customers over the, um, over the extent of debt payable in the event of insolvency. That may well be the case, but there is no contracting out of, talk, uh, of payment for damages in tort. If you are the director of a limited company and the agents of your company damage somebody else's life or property, the company can be sued. If the company's assets are insufficient to pay the damages awarded, then again, the assets of the owners and the directors of that company are untouched. Now, one of the consequences of limited liability, which is the main, which is the main benefit of incorporation, is that companies are able to attract much larger amounts of investment capital than would otherwise be the case. You, you see, if I invest, if I invest in Paul, if I invest in your private business, which is running parties of some kind. Um, and and you go bankrupt. I, I may be associated in your bankruptcy so far as I can be called a partner. If, on the other hand, you set up a limited liability company, uh, a limited company, forgive me, then I can buy shares in your organisation. <coughs> and if you go down in a wealth of lawsuits, then again, I can walk away. I lose the value of my shares, but nothing else. And so because of that, people are more inclined to invest their money in limited companies. And that means that those companies can grow larger. Uh, another consequence of the incorporation laws is that because there is a natural separation of ownership and control, it's possible for limited companies to avoid the, the normal business life cycle. So, so you, start, you start a small business, it works, you grow rich, uh, you then get old and past it, the business starts to crumble, or you hand it over to your children who may not be so um, hard working as you do. And so the company has a limit to its size and a limit to, <coughs> and, and a limit to the time that it lasts. With limited companies like Nestle, for example, which was set up in 1869, it, it is in principle immortal. The first generation of shareholders died maybe 100 years, over 100 years ago. The first generation of directors and managers died a very long time ago. But they reproduced themselves from generation to generation. And, and it is therefore possible for these companies to last a long time uh, and to grow much larger than would otherwise be the case. In the absence of any incorporation laws, 
it is unlikely that Amazon would be such a large business organization. I'm, I'm not attacking Jeff Bezos. He is a wonderful man. He's put a lot of money in my pocket over the years. But he is the beneficiary of state privilege so far as he directs a limited company, which has been able to attract much more funding than might otherwise have been the case. It's unlikely that Facebook and Twitter would be such large organizations. It's unlikely that virtually any limited li that virtually any large organization would be as large as it is without those incorporation rules. And so because these are only formally private organizations, I, I would suggest that um, that the company laws should be altered so that these organizations are compelled to respect the freedom of speech of their employees <coughs> and of their customers. So far, Facebook has been compelled to respect the censorship laws of the jurisdictions within which it operates. Facebook is being chased by the French and German governments at the moment over the postings made by various people on Facebook. All I'm suggesting is that uh, Facebook, Twitter, Google, Amazon, etc., etc., should be compelled to respect the freedom of speech laws in the various jurisdictions where they operate. And if it is legal to say something in England, then it should, then, then Facebook should not be able to terminate the accounts of people in England who say those things. These are not purely private organizations. They benefit from a grant of state privilege and they should be made to pay for those grants of state privilege by respecting <coughs> the various bills of rights in the jurisdictions where they operate. They should respect the right to freedom of speech of their customers, and they should respect the right to freedom of speech and freedom of association of their employees. Now, when you come to employees, I suppose there are certain difficulties. Let's imagine that... Um, let, let's imagine that you have a school and it turns out that one of the teachers is an impassioned advocate of, of the right for adults to have sex with two-year-olds. Should the school be compelled to respect that person's right to freedom of speech and to continue his employment? Uh, and the answer is Probably not. But if somebody's opinions are tangential to the, uh, to the reasonable function of that organization, then yes, that person should enjoy the same employment protection rights as, a black per as he would do as a black person or a homosexual or a woman. Or, any, or a disabled person, or any of the other protected categories under the 2010 Equalities Act. Um, obviously, you need to, well, I need to think a great deal harder about this. What is central to the reasonable purpose of the organization? Well, Tesco might say, and I'm nothing against Tesco, don't shop there, but nothing against it, Tesco might say, we define ourselves as a diverse corporation, and so we don't wish to employ Richard Dragon, because we find his views of politics. They are offensive to our, to, to our other employees and perhaps our customers. To which I would say, no, the function of Tesco, as reasonably defined, is, is to sell food. Uh, and whatever else is on the shelves. It, it, it is not to promote diversity in the workplace or anywhere else. And so you, you have no more right to sack Richard Dragon for his opinions but than you have to sack someone <coughs> for, his, um, for his homosexuality or blackness or, or Jewishness. That doesn't mean that if you are... That doesn't mean that if you are 
a practicing Satanist, you should have the right to teach in a Catholic school. It, it doesn't mean if you are a militant vegan that you should have the right to uh, work on the meat counter in, uh, again, Tesco's. Uh, but it, it does mean a certain protection for um, uh, a certain protection for employees and customers. I don't believe that this should apply to unincorporated businesses because they are private, but they are both formally and actually private. I run an organization called the Center for Ancient Studies, which teaches Greek, Latin, and classical civilization. Um, Clients, in, well, private clients, schools, colleges, all, all sorts of, um, all sorts of clients. Never enough, I might say, but some. Now, that is an unincorporated, that's an unincorporated business. It's Sean Gad Trading Ads, uh, and I believe that I should have the absolute right to do business or not to do business with anyone I choose. If, if someone comes to and says, uh, "Please, Sean, will you teach me Greek?" I have the right to say, no, I don't like tattoos, take this, and I'll be off with you. But then you see, I don't have, the, I, I don't have any state-granted privilege. It, it, I have to pay my debts. I, I can't walk away from them. And so it would be an act of state oppression to force me to do business with people against my conscience or even against my prejudices. But if you are, a limited company, if you're running a limited <coughs> company, then you should be then you should be subject to various laws which prevent this degree of corporate censorship. The my own long term preference would be for the abolition of the um, of incorporation as a category. Get rid of limited liability ensure that all business organizations were sole traderships, partnerships, what have you. Um, but that is extraordinarily unlikely to happen in the short term. In the meantime, we do have the precedent of the various anti-discrimination laws. And, and this, I suggest, is the only way to shut down a real and present danger. This is not some hypothetical danger. It is real. There was a time when these big businesses were only interested in making money. Uh, and when that was the case, let's say in the 1980s, when that was the case, <coughs> you could look the other way from limited liability and say, well, it doesn't matter. It doesn't have any particularly bad effects. But uh, ever since the cultural leftists moved into the corporate world, that they've been spreading their views from various human resources departments, diversity departments, and all sorts of other things. It's a bit like um, cultural leftism or totalitarian humanism, or again, whatever you want to call it, has been spreading through the business world like, uh, like herpes. Fingers party. It, it just goes round and round and round. And at the moment, as I said, if your views are considered particularly abhorrent by the powers that be, you will not be able to publish your books on Amazon, which means effectively you will not be able to publish your books. You won't be able to sell them. You will not be able to spread your ideas on Facebook and Twitter. You will not be able to receive donations or um, you won't be able to take payments through PayPal and it is possible as the technology moves on that you will be banned from buying food in the supermarkets and the only short-term effective solution to that is to accept that we do though in principle they are of course evil but to accept that we do have anti-discrimination laws and, and to insist that those anti-discrimination laws, which will not be repealed in the foreseeable future, should be extended to cover political belief. Um, which means that if you are 
if you are a limited, if you are a committed Christian and your bakery is a limited company, then what I'm saying is that yes, you should indeed be compelled to bake that wedding cake. Not, not if you are an unincorporated association, not if you are a sole tradership or a partnership. I, I'm not saying that um, I regard anti-discrimination laws as in any sense a good thing. Uh, I'm simply saying that they exist and extending them is probably the lesser of evils than allowing this cloud of censorship to spread far beyond the state throughout the corporate world. Now, um, I, I could go on and on, but I think I've said everything, have I? Yes, sir. How long have I been speaking? 30 minutes? 35. Excellent. Okay, that's it. And let, let me suggest that um, I, I know that quite often these discussions are centred on the speaker. Sean, do you think this? Sean, do you think that? I, I've said most of what I think. Um, if, if people want to... If the question and answer session could become, in part, a general discussion, I shall not feel at all proud. Thank you very much indeed. Yeah, um, I, I do agree that uh, what we're seeing right now is, is problematic that uh, um, companies start to uh, um, ban certain uh, certain ideas and promote others uh, very very actively. Um, I'm not sure if I agree with your solution because um, I'm, I'm I'm simply as you as you started out I'm, I'm very uneasy to promote new rules the state should do to. Uh, to bring uh, to to basically regulate the market, I think what we're seeing is we have a, we have a crisis that, that lots of people start <coughs> believing that it is a good thing to have an open debate and to to um, to let let people speak. And as long as that's the case, I don't think we will see uh, uh, legislation coming in that compels uh, companies to uh, observe free speech. If you can get a majority for that, I think the problem will go away automatically because if people value open debates and, 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 and value to hear all kinds of opinions, then they will demand it from, from, from companies, mm -hmm. which um, uh, I, of course, I don't have any problem with uh, criticizing private companies because that's part of, of, of the market. You know, if, if I go to a restaurant and I don't like the food, I have everybody to, to say, look, don't go to the restaurant. Because they, they they have bad foods, and at the same time, I, in the same sense, I have every right to criticize Facebook or YouTube or whatever if they do stuff that I that I don't agree with. Um, but I think this this needs to be this this whole thing needs to be won in the in the in the, in the public debate and not uh, not in uh, in by bringing new legislation. I think. Um, so I. Uh, uh, Another view, which is so limited liability, is a very interesting point that you make around limited liability. Um, there is another way that large corporations benefit uh, from the from the state, and that is that they are closer than smaller corporations or than individuals to the fountain of money, which is uh, you know, central banks and uh, open market operations or uh, um, Bank of England lending or whatever it may be. So. The, um, today, these large organizations like Facebook and like Amazon, they're the ones that have access to pretty much unlimited amounts of money and pretty much zero interest rates, which just allows them to grow bigger and bigger. So we also have this kind of winner takes all, first move revenge situation where it's almost, you know, the, the horse is bolted and uh, it's hard to get back. So for me, what, uh, and I'm a sort of, uh, uh, cryptocurrency enthusiast too, so I'm biased, but I, I do think that separation of money and state would also um, have, have an influence. Um, so um, you know, that's something that I would like like to see happen is uh, okay, um, need a change in, in money, and that's obviously also completely utopian, not going to happen. Yeah. But uh, you know, uh, these these companies also have this this benefit um, of a financial nature. Okay, can, I, can I break in and answer those yes, questions? Sure. Yes, Thank sure. you. Um, what I'll say is that um, you are indeed both being 
a touch utopian. It would be delightful if we could have a separation of state and money, but it's not going to happen. Not, not in the foreseeable future. <coughs> it would be very nice if we could get rid of all anti-discrimination laws, but it's not going to happen in the foreseeable future. But we do have a clear and present danger of corporate censorship. Uh, we, we have the established fact of corporate censorship, and we need to do something needs to be done about it. Okay. Now, it is not utopian to argue for More a small extension of an existing law, to, uh, of existing anti-discrimination laws to cover to cover political belief. Um, it, it is much easier. Now, uh, Nico, you said that the moment you have a majority who believe in this, then you don't need to have the law in the first place. But there is some truth in that, but it would be very difficult to assemble any kind of effective majority in this country for abolishing these anti-discrimination laws. It would be much easier to argue from the premises of anti-discrimination laws for a slight extension just as the laws were established to prevent people from discriminating against black people, they were then extended to stop people from discriminating against women, and then against Muslims, homosexuals, and all the others. And so it does seem to be just a slight step to covering political belief. Indeed, already in this country, the Equalities Act has been used to prevent people from being sacked on account of their political views. I can't remember the details of it, but some years ago, a, a BNP member lost his job as a bus driver. U usual grounds, we serve a diverse community, and this person has no place. And the employment tribunal said, oh, you know, nothing to do with that. Your job is to uh, drive buses, not to not to spread sweet as you like. Uh, and so, to some extent, we already in this country have such a law, which we don't have in the United States. And, and so, all I'm arguing for is a slight extension of an existing set of laws, a, a slight widening of an existing legal framework, which is much more likely to be effective that arguing for the abolition of limited liability, which I would love, or, or the separation of money and state, which I'd love, or, or just the straight abolition of, of most governments, which I would, of course, adore, but it won't happen. And in the meantime, in, in, in the meantime, one of us may wake up tomorrow and find that our books have been delisted from Amazon. Is anyone else's? <coughs> Um, I agree with you on most of what you say uh, about definitely about the corporate uh, censorship. Uh, but I have to disagree with you say about you can pretty much see anything you want in this country because you have the Public Order Act, you have the Communications Act, and these within, especially within the last few years, there has been, well, let's compare it to this in Russia, where apparently they abuse civil liberties a lot if you believe the narrative. I mean, in orders of hate speech laws, they've only arrested about 600 people, a massive country. But in this country, just last year, we've arrested almost 6,000 people. Mm. The exact same thing. Yeah. So I, you know, and I've, I've spoken about it, I, I give speeches as well a lot, and I speak about this a lot. And if you're pushing, if you're saying, you know, and I do agree with you, it is more realistic to simply have, um, you know, extend the law or whatever. But I would go even further and go, well, why not have a codified constitution where freedom of speech and it's, it's not only uh, limiting government, but also limiting the corporate world as well to believe that? Because in my opinion, I don't think we really do have a con Well, we do have a constitution, but it's not like an American one where it, is, it, it focuses more on civil liberties. Mm. It's more of a convention of what to do next sort of thing, but it's just based on upon laws and stuff that have come out that ancient enough. I mean, 
Would you agree with the codified constitution, which is so restricted uh, not only governments, but... Oh, you have these little fantasies. Supposing I were asked to draw up a constitution for England, or, or, or just a little more narrow, supposing I were asked to draw up a Bill of Rights for England, then yes, you can think of all sorts of things. But the, the, the problem is that also isn't going to happen. Um, Whereas extending the anti, whereas extending the anti-discrimination laws is probably feasible. Now, now, okay, I accept your point that we do not enjoy, we do not enjoy complete legal freedom of speech in this country. You, you do have all of these laws, and I, I I'm not aware of the figure of six thousand people arrested, but so I'm not four thousand. Four thousand, but I'm not willing to contest it because it sounds likely. Um, that being said, we do enjoy a very substantial protection in this country of our freedom of speech. Um, much more so than many other countries in the world. It just isn't as it just isn't as extensive protection as we would like. But but you see, the real danger to freedom of speech it is not that the police will march into this room and start arresting us or pistol whipping us. The, the danger is, is simply that um, your Twitter account will be terminated. Mm -hmm. that, that, that is much more likely. Yeah, I respond yeah. to that. Mm -hmm. So, just the other, I think it was actually last month, um, there was a lady from oh, somewhere in the Midlands, I can't remember what, I think Lincolnshire maybe, and she said a tweet. She was sort of debating mm -hmm. slash arguing with a transgender individual who. Mm -hmm was a man who then transitioned into a woman. Mm. You know, whether you believe that, irregardless of what you think that is a, a man or a woman, she called this individual, no, you are a man. Mm. Yeah. And she was, uh, I think she was, you know, like you say, blocked from Twitter. But then, if, where it should have just simply ended there, she also was then dragged to the magistrate's court, and the CPS, I believe, found her guilty. Mm. So, it, it, it's not just simply trans. It's not just simply stopping at the corporate world. It's now bleeding in to into into, into real life in a way. Yes. And it's now it's now going beyond that. It's almost as if Twitter and Facebook and all that the corporate these corporate entities these technocrats we want to call them they're now the ones telling the state or telling the police the authority who's to arrest who are the nasty people. What we know how you're saying yeah. like, you know, yeah. it's just, it's, it's, it seems to be going a bit out of control. So. Yes. Um, I'm vaguely aware of the, of the case that you've um, mentioned. Don't like it, of course I don't like it. Um, it happens, it's wrong, but it's quite, it, it's much easier to address that than the amorphous censorship of the corporate world. You can insist that the Crown Prosecution Service should um, sh should redefine its various policies. You, you need a new director of public prosecutions. You need perhaps a slightly less authoritarian government. Th these things do happen from time to time. Whereas w what we are drifting into is a situation of entrenched corporate censorship. Indeed, we're reaching the point where we could actually have some, we could actually have a constitution um, with the same protection of freedom of speech as the United States, but we still would not have really effective freedom of speech. Indeed, that is the situation in the United States. The law says that you can say virtually anything you like. I think you can say anything you like in that country. It's just that you can't if, if you uh, want to put bread on the table. Uh, and that's the problem. Uh, Paul? Uh, sorry, uh, but you can have a go next. Paul? Do you want to speak next? Yeah. Okay, um, but, but Paul first, and then you afterwards. Okay, uh, sure, yeah. Uh, might it be the case that there's a little bit of special pleading going on here, in that you're a highly successful published author who has controversial opinions and might be more in line to be victimised by Amazon or Twitter or something like a lot of people who have created users mm. of these things. So a lot of I know a lot of conservatives who use YouTube are often moaning about them being self being demonetised and so there's a lot of threat of people 
there is a direct and present danger for people who try to make a living mm. out of using this very modern media. But in the long run, if you let the market operate, there will be other firms coming up to replace it if they start throwing up too many people. Other firms will come in and take them over. And I also think, again, about your comments on limited liability. I think it's very unrealistic that a purely libertarian society could only operate on sole traders with absolute liability. Something, as you say, I think like limited liability would arise on the market as through insurance and things because you're just simply not going to get the efficiencies of the market that people expect without it there. It would be, I think, it would be there. Yeah, assuming that that is what the free market entails, that you're saying that you're putting at risk people's, you know, all of people's you know, savings, life savings, style of life and that should be at risk for, a, for an economic collapse. And the people who were the creditors would get a very small extra benefit if you really went after the individual owner's personal assets. Mm. And that's unrealistic. Um, and I think, you know, you might be doing a little bit of special pleading because you, you feel yourself uniquely, and you probably are, <laughs> very vulnerable to, uh, to be the next person in line of attack. Yeah. Uh, two points there, Paul. The first is um, an invitation to a long argument over limited liability. <laughs> And let's decline that for a moment. But let's, yeah. <laughs> let's reserve it. Um, special pleading. Well, of course it may be, yes. I, I, do, I, I do look at the approach of the censorship, and I worry that my own books might one day be delisted, and my own YouTube videos might be demonetized. But practically speaking, it's not going to happen because I am not an effective enemy of the system. I am not... Um, I, I don't believe in any, of the, um, in any of the prescribed ideas. My fear is... Well, no, th th there is a possible fear. It's possible that um, I, shall be, I shall be accidentally swept up in the next purge, just as... Um, Quite, if you establish a police state and decide to round up all your political opponents, you, you may find that unfortunately your younger brother was among the people thrown out of a helicopter or bayoneted in the football stadium, purely accidental. Or I may be worried that sooner or later there will be nothing else left to ban, so they might as well turn to me. But it's not very likely. But the fact that I am operating in those areas means that, it may not mean that I am frightened for myself, but it may mean that I am more strongly aware of the dangers than people who don't operate in those areas. So, partial agreement. Uh, the United States has freedom of speech. Well, that's really not true. We have the left and we have the right side if you uh, you have the middle class and if you don't agree with them they will just you know you know they will destroy you we don't have the uh, only thing we have we have the first constitute freedom of speech yeah. second the bear arms now that works you know and my partner he has a gun and we have a you know we have a right to do that yeah. but we do not have freedom of speech because if you don't say the right things at the right time they will cut you off. They're trying to cut off the talk show hosts mm. show because they have freedom of speech. But we do not have, you have more freedom of speech than we do. You have access, I looked at your television. We couldn't have, say, swears on the television in the United States. No, that's not allowed. Mm. We do not have freedom of speech like you guys have. They're cutting it out. Well, hi. hi <laughs> I enjoy your books. They're very graphic. Thanks. And I, I like any, I, I like uh, you, I like your hard copy publication, which you send me. Elegant. It's a good one. Yeah, that is good. I enjoy it. Um, yeah. Well, because I don't know America that well, I'll just agree with you, or I'll go along with you. I, I know that America is not a libertarian paradise. Uh, and let's, I think we can all agree on that. I, I, I just don't know in which country you have greater effective freedom of speech. You've got that wonderful First Amendment, but... Um, it doesn't work. No. It works if you have enough money, I think. 
Jesus. Exactly. Yeah. We're the fruit, and uh, we're the many, and they're the fruit. Yeah. We have the middle class. They got the money. Yeah. And they can decide what we want. If you've been following, you've been following the politics in the United States, the left from the right, we're cheaters. Yeah. The left is no, we're hoop loops. The left is no better than the right. No. No. They're hoods, they're gangsters. It's rather sad that, like, it would be nice if the Americans came along to argue that they did have freedom of speech. It's just that I don't know any Americans who do. Anyway, um, let me turn it slightly. Um, is there, is this corporate censorship such a serious problem? Um, I tend to be rather sensitive to these things, but I've been sensitive to all sorts of things for 40 years, and most of them haven't happened. We still don't have identity cards, and um, most of the awful things I predicted back in the 90s still haven't come entirely to pass. And, and so perhaps my fears that uh, people will be prevented from buying food in the supermarkets it is um, a, an equally outrageous fear. I don't know. It depends if it's a monopoly, right? Well, if you can, if it's Tesco, you're buying food, and Sainsbury's doesn't, then you're OK. But if, all of them, but if it's only Tesco's, mm. or if they all stop you buying food, then you're screwed. Right? The Asian corner shop won't stop you buying food. <laughs> you still buy food in the Asian corner shop. Yeah, that's yeah. true. Yeah. They just cost 50% more. <laughs> yeah. but, Pat? Okay, yeah, I, actually on that point, I, I think you need a, really need a cashless society to be able to do that. But just to come back to that, what do you think is behind the war on cash? I mean, I suspect that behind it, the things to do with high finance, for example, negative interest rates. I mean, in a nutshell, to put it very simply, I mean, you, you, you could keep uh, millions of pounds in, in a rucksack and uh, that wouldn't be subject to negative mm -hmm. interest rates. Mm -hmm. if, if you didn't have cash, then there's no way you could escape uh, the state control of, mm -hmm. of, of negative interest rates. So I suspect this I finance. But more recently, I've come to think that maybe there's something more behind this. <coughs> I mean, I'll just give you a simple example. Um, I, I, I tend to use um, left luggage lockers a lot. Uh, and and uh, it's certainly, I mean, recently uh, in Amsterdam, putting your left luggage there, I tried to pay cash, and they would say, no, no cash, only uh, credit cards. And, you know, and, and usually you argue with these people, and they'd end up saying, this, uh, first of all, you want it. I should have said, no, I want it. You know, it's like it's voted for in some council yeah. odd election. Uh, and secondly, it's to stop the terrorists. <coughs> and which, to which I always say, well, I think you'll find all the terrorists have actually been caught with credit cards on them, mm -hmm. oddly enough, given to them by the state yeah. <laughs> from the European Union. But I, I suspect there's something more behind it than that. I mean, what do you think is, is behind oh, the war on cash? I don't think there's any single agenda behind the war on cash. Um, I, I think that if we had an entirely libertarian society, there would be a diminishing use of cash. Cash is inconvenient. Uh, I mean, you can get some nasty infections from other people, and you, know, you carry you, you carry you carry lots of dirty metal, strips of dirty paper. If you don't want it, I'll have it. <laughs> well, <yeah>. um, <laughs> dirty metal. No, no, no. But, but it is a consideration. I think there would be a t there would be a drift, a, a slight drift away from cash, simply on those grounds. Uh, mm -hmm. Keeping money in your wallet or keeping money at home where it can be stolen, whereas it's <coughs> unlikely to be stolen from a bank account. So that's part of it. I think people. People do find cash inconvenient. I, I, you know, I carry about fifty pence with me in cash most of the time. I, I just don't bother. But the the other agendas, uh, the, there's the war on drugs and money laundering, which may be a it may be um, some kind of pantomime, but it's it's a real excuse. There's uh, the state's worry about tax evasion. If you take if you sell goods and services uh, with cash, well. You don't have to pay tax, do you? Uh, and, and then, uh, as I said earlier, 
the, um, the central bankers would really love to be able to cut interest rates to minus 10% or do all sorts of things. Uh, and, and if people can't run to the bank and grab their money out, uh, there's no leakage from the system. You, you, can, have, um, you can have deficit financing uh, until the economy burns out. So it, there's no one there's no one group of shadowy international Illuminati or something saying let's abolish cash to turn people into sheep. It's something that is coming about partly because people want it, partly because it's now possible, but also because it's being pushed by various sinister or, or simply illegitimate agencies. Um, I yeah, um, to come back to the, uh, the idea that we extend the injury discrimination of political groups, I see, I see the huge um, uh, practical pro uh, problems with this because um, what, what uh, constitutes a, a discrimination against political groups? Paul, for example, mentions that lots of people are demonetized. Is that a discrimination? A lot of people suspect that it is, but I, I think what's going on there is mostly actually not a discrimination. What's mostly going on there is uh, lots of companies have thrown a lot of advertisement money uh, online, and more and more companies thinking this is a, is a magic bullet to get their, their products uh, sold. But they're more, more discovering that actually very very little of that, that money is actually eff effective in advertising. It's perfectly sensible for a company. Um, to not want to be advertising uh, in front of the Ku Klux Klan, for example. That, that has nothing to do with their political views, it's just mm. bad for business. And, and, and that's very sensible. Yeah. So are, are, are people entitled, for example, to make a living out of videos that are just rubbish? Uh, and and I, I don't think they are. Well, l let me put this to you. Do, do you think, um, I, I know there are leftists who would say, oh, it happens all the time, that's why it was all set up. Do, do you seriously believe that um, YouTube demonetizes black people's videos and gay videos because YouTube is a group of racists and homophobes? And the answer is no, they wouldn't. Um, but if they did, if they did demonetize or, 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 or cancel the uh, accounts of various gay groups or black groups, they would have to justify themselves in court. Uh, and the knowledge that they have to justify themselves in court means that they do follow fairly just procedures for doing that. And if you had an extension to the law saying that you can't do this to people whose views you don't like either, you'd suddenly find that um, all, all sorts of people would not have their videos demonetized without an objectively good reason. Yes. Um, so, uh, maybe a bit of good news is, is that um, although we can't necessarily, uh, uh, although right now uh, these people are being censored on these mainstream platforms, it's not just that they that, that they need to be heard on those platforms, but they they just need somewhere to be heard, don't they? In the first instance, and uh, and there are a lot of uh, or there are platforms starting to appear now that are censorship resistant, either in their policies, but more importantly in their technology. And another thing that's coming out of the blockchain space, which is, I think is quite encouraging, if we can't achieve separation of money and state, which I don't disagree with you on at all, it's uh, definitely a utopian concept, uh, then at least we can build platforms that are censorship resistant. And so taking YouTube as an example, there's a, a website called DTube, mm. which is uh, decentralized tube, and it's absolutely fantastic, and you can put pretty much anything on there. Uh, yes. There's Twitch, and there's uh, several others. That's encouraging. Yes, I, I accept your point. This may be, this may be a passing phase. It, it may be that um, the apparently inexorable rise of e-based big business it is a temporary phenomenon. And in five years' time, people will be thinking, well, what was all the fuss about? But um, it may not be. And we have a problem at the moment, and this problem may continue for quite a long time. Now, we have freedom of speech in this room. 
when when David or Nico booked this room, you didn't have to show identification, you didn't need sort of license from the police. There's no police officer sit, sitting in on this meeting. Uh, nobody is taking, nobody outside this room is taking any interest in what we're saying. None that we know of. Yes, but there isn't. You see, there, the there, there are countries. There are countries. Uh, that, that's uh, for my own protection. Okay. But there are countries in which meetings of this kind must be recorded, and copies of the recording must be lodged with the local police. Um, now, nothing like that in this country. It's just that. If we want to spread these meetings, we do, we have little choice at the moment. It's Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. Uh, oh, somebody else will come back and say, oh, there's this one as well. And I'll say, yes, yes, there's Gab, there's VK and so on. But you are looking at Facebook, Twitter, YouTube. And if those organisations decide not to, to allow libertarian anti-state propaganda, then this meeting might as well not have taken place as far as the overall uh, the overall struggle is concerned. And that's the problem we face at the moment. It may be that in 5, 10, 20 years, YouTube will be a memory. You, you, you'll need footnotes in, in school books. Uh, to remind school, to tell school children, YouTube was an early um, was an early video sharing website. Went out of business in 2025 or something, but that's not the case at the moment. So we have these vast semi-monopolistic global platforms. I agree with you. Um, the, the worry, the worrying thing about it though is that I think there is some kind of. Um, Gaming pay in a way where Facebook, Twitter, etc., you Google on well, YouTube, they want to be regulated, mm -hmm. right, by government, right? And I feel as though it's that they're pushing this censorship because they are destined for regulation, I think, because of the way that they're banning. And there is there is um, there is evidence to support. I think this gentleman has said that there are there are factually way more conservatives being uh, censored than liberals, you know, I use that term loosely, um, you know, in, in America exceptionally, like, because the whole point is, is that if you were to ask a liberal person, you know, back to the transgender sort of thing, like, oh, is this, is this a man or is this a woman? They'll go, oh, they, they, whatever they want to be, you know, whatever, you know? Mm. But if you were to ask a conservative-minded individual, and they say, gun to head, is that a man or a woman? They would say, whatever the original um, person was born as, that, that gender. Now, the problem with that is that that's in Twitter's actual terms and conditions. So they are knowingly or unknowingly biased towards uh, liberal-minded people. Mm. So they're sort of thing. So now and that's why Mark Zuckerberg and um, Jack Dorsey, who owns a, uh, Twitter CEO, they've been dragged to the Senate, you know, and they've been made to ask all these questions and all this. And I think it's eventually that they will be regulated by it. And if the sort of state sort of takes them over in some sort of way, then that will prolong their existence. I mean, if you look at GM in America, and you, you compare the FTSE 100, what do they call it? The Fortune 500 um, from 100 years ago. There are companies there that you've never even heard of, but they naturally, like you say, gone from a natural cycle or simply coming and going. But when the state took over GM, they're still here now. Yeah. So it just prolongs yeah. their existence. So that's what I'm worried about is that these social media sites. They, they want to be regulated because it will prolong their existence. Because now, at the moment, Facebook, Twitter, they're naturally declining. They're, they're starting to damage members rather than actually gain them. Now, they, they've reached their peak. So what are they doing? I want to survive. How can I survive? Well, we get the government to sort of take us over. We'll, we'll practically almost be immortal. Like, you know, and I'm just worrying that. I mean, that, that's just my tin hat foil theory, but do you think that's a, do you think that, that, that's a possible it's a good one. It's a good one, and I think there's some truth in it. The, the only observation I'd make is that if I were Mark Zuckerberg and I wanted Facebook to be regulated in that way, I think I'd be shutting down gay groups all over the place. Mm. And that's not happening. I, I belong to 
I belong to a Facebook group called the Companions of Antinous, which is it's a strange crossover group between classicists and gay people, and um, publish all sorts of things in that group. No one turns a hair. But um, I, I do have friends who've been in Facebook prison, mm. uh, and the, the conservative friends in Facebook prison. Mm. Sorry, Facebook what? Facebook prison. I mean, is, does that even exist? No, no, it doesn't. <laughs> 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 yeah, you, you, what do you it say? Means, you, you're, you're, shut, you're, you're, you're switched off for 30 days. Oh, okay. What, 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 yeah, what I'm going to say, just on, on that on that theme, very quickly. I mean, when I, I was a, a worked for British Telecom for, for a few years, mm -hmm. and um, the only you know the, you know the green boxes you see around the, the city. Oh yes, yes. The only ones which were locked had a big padlock on them, because none of them have got padlocks. If you have a look closely, no, uh, no. except the ones in the city of London where they, they have uh, financial things going on. The only ones. But uh, what I've noticed uh, on Twitter, for example, I haven't seen on Facebook yet, I've noticed on Twitter that I've seen locks on them. You actually see a physical <coughs> lock on them, and you can't gain access either. But it's only uh, people dealing in finance, accountancy, <coughs> financial analysts, and so forth. And uh, I, I just wondered what the, um, you were talking about people being shut out and what have you. I mean, there's, I mean, long ago, uh, that, you know, that, that, that's a general rule. That's been, people have been shut out from uh, communicating with, uh, in, in, I mean, I couldn't, I couldn't do that kind of thing to my own account. So there seems to be some kind of special rules or laws governing people in these positions. I mean, I don't know if you know anything about that, or what's your comments on that? I have no particular expertise on that. Um, on the subject of privacy, should I tell you something that's rather humiliating? I don't believe that the state or its agencies is watching me. You don't believe me? I don't believe I'm being spied on. I don't believe my telephone calls are being listened to. I don't believe my emails are being intercepted. I don't believe anyone's opening my posts. I don't believe anyone's anyone's watching my house to see who's, who comes and goes. Um, as far as the state is concerned, I exist as a taxpayer and I exist as a national insurance number. I, I did... Um, in the moment of bravado, I did, a, I did um, a freedom of information request on the, uh, on the police some years ago, asking to see my file, and they wrote back saying, never heard of you. And I think that's the case with the overwhelming majority of people in this country, including everybody in this room. Mm -hmm. um, of course, it doesn't mean that I will stop using clear white, it, it doesn't mean that I'll stop using envelopes and I'll turn to clear plastic packaging when I send things through the post, uh, but I, I'm not terribly worried about omnipresent surveillance at the moment. Most of those video cameras don't work, and even the face recognition is probably not that good. Why do you trust the, the, the freedom of information request was completely <laughs> no transparent, right? I mean, if they were tracking your stuff, they might have some sort of secret injunction to, to respond to the freedom of organisation request and say, yeah, we haven't got anything on us. Not me. They wouldn't. They, they've nothing to hide, as far as I'm concerned. I don't believe they've ever been paying much attention to me. I sort of. I mean, not to agree, but with the email, I suspect that if they did get any, um, they thought, well, let's check this person out, then they would have access to. I used to send emails with um, with provocative footers, Simtex, Queen Mother, Tony Blair, Boom, etc. Wondering what effect it would have, uh, because back in those days, I believed that all emails were being filtered through these vast computers and, and flagged up. Perhaps some of my emails were flagged up, and someone said, "Oh, look, another Wally." No, but. <laughs> Um, you know, if you look, if you try to stand in the state shoes at the moment, you're rather frightened, and 
powerless because your control over things it is much smaller than it was 20 years ago and much, much smaller than it was 40 or 50 years ago. But that doesn't mean that, that, doesn't mean that the threats to freedom have gone away. That they, they've just um, become more diverse. Are you there? Bob? Yeah. Let's just celebrate the fact that there's never been so much cheap stuff to read out there. Such, such a diversity of opinion, such a... Mm -hmm. Such, such a brilliant so well and emphatically put, and all for, all for free now, of yes. course. And it would be a shame to lose it to any extent, but it's just been a wonderful time for seeing what other people really think, apparently, and there's very silly ideas to justify what they really think should be done. Um, admittedly, you're talking about the dangers to this, uh, the disappearance of this liberty and this, this cornucopia of teachers, Duff and gems, of course, available on internet but it's a wonderful time to be surfing and looking and searching and you have to pay for it it, it is it is bob and uh, I, i'm glad you said that it's something with which i fully agree but i didn't mention it yes i i do agree that our effective right to receive information has expanded immeasurably in the last 25 years um we can now read things in complete security and for free that we didn't even know about at one point. Um, my fear is that this will gradually be whittled away. Uh, and the way, the, the way to take it away is to go after the people who are creating it. Huh? Oh yeah, yeah. Just a quick thing on on you not being uh, under surveillance and so forth. I mean, I, I wouldn't underestimate the, the state's ability to flag up people. Mm. Uh, just to give you a simple example, uh, I remember in, in the early noughties, um, you know, before this electronic stuff had really come in and things were more mechanical. Um, if you mentioned certain names uh, on on the telephone, for example. Uh, Irish terrorism was still a thing then. Not so much now, but it was then, even after the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, Jerry Adams or any of the other, you know, big uh, noises in, in, the, uh, in, in, in the Irish community. Uh, you would hear your, the telephone actually start clicking. Mm. And it, it's, this was well known, actually, as long as you said it, because, you know, you, the mechanical devices were, were kicking in. Uh, artificial intelligence at a basic level. Um, and, and other names as well. You could actually hear that, so yeah. that you that would kick in. You would immediately be flagged up, <coughs> obviously, by the authorities. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was before all the electronic stuff negated uh, the, the, the that, so you wouldn't hear yeah. that now. But there is a ma massive amount of uh, uh, surveillance going on in the system. There's no, no question of that. Oh yes, yes. There's a massive amount of surveillance. But when everyone is under surveillance, no one is under yeah. surveillance. <laughs> um, I, I, I don't. Buy into that incident. No. I mean, that's ridiculous. But, but okay, <laughs> yes. That's the government's position. Yes. Then, if you've got nothing to hide, you've got nothing to worry about. Uh, I do agree. I don't, think, I don't believe, well, I don't know if you, you know, you could work for MI6, I don't know, but I don't believe everyone in this room is being uh, surveil surveillance in a you know, major way. I know we've got a thing with a mass watch city in the Western world, I believe. Is that right? London, yeah, you've got about 60,000 playing cam cameras, and that's, that's more than three times as much as the next biggest one, I believe. I might be wrong on that, we can check that. But, and I do agree with this gentleman that um, there has been a great available um, graphs of information of late, but I don't think that's on the pleasure of the state. I don't think the state has gone, oh, you know, we have to make us all opening and I think this, that should become naturally through uh, these uh, companies that started. So like when YouTube started, it was never meant to be this this forum for political debate. I, used to, I think the first of the video was Man at Zoo, where you know people were sharing cat videos and stuff like that. It's only through natural development. I think the next, the major, first major movement on it was the atheist movement, and eventually it is what it is now. Thank you, David. And what I, what I do think is, is that. I think if we were to be a person of interest and came out and fallen in the side of the state's sort of poor, 
we would be somehow blacklisted in some way, would be unpersoned. Like, I mean, you've got individuals who try to come over here, people I have, and people know about Lauren Sub and a Canadian lady, uh, Brittany Pettibar, an American lady, uh, Michael Savage, an uh, uh, American uh, DJ guy. Richard Spencer. Is he, has he been banned as well? He was know. banned by Theresa May. Oh, was he? I didn't yeah. know. Uh, and a few other people as well. And it, I think some of them were even detained under the Terrorism Act, mm. simply for being an edgy YouTuber. I mean, uh, it's unbelievable that the, the Terrorism Act has been used to detain uh, 22-year-old young ladies. You know? Long girl, wasn't it? The long girl that was yes, banned. that one, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Simply because, I think the, the irony being, they wanted to come over Speaker's Corner to deliver a speech about freedom of speech, <laughs> therefore proving their point that we don't really have freedom of speech. <laughs> like, yeah. So I, I know obviously other countries have more freedoms than others, but I honestly believe that there is a erosion of our civil liberties just slowly over time. So it's like that sort of boiling frog analogy where, you know, obviously a frog was to jump into boiling water, it would immediately jump out again. But if a, job, if a frog was to jump into a water and it was slowly boiled, the frog would just naturally die because it wasn't aware of the, uh, of the change in, in the climate. Mm. So you said, that's when Al Gore says. Um, but I do think that, you know, like you say, if, if everyone's being watched, then no one's really being watched at all. But Julian Assange, for example, is sitting yeah, there, yeah, just yes, being yes, a journalist, yes, 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 exposing the government. I was going to say that too. Like, um, so if it's a freedom of information, like you said, well, would you believe it? But there was an interest in that Assange actually release called Vault 7, I don't know if anyone knows. Yeah. Where basically, what it is, is, is that MI6 and the CIA they can't spy on their own citizens. But what they can do is, is that they can meet, they can meet up and exchange each other's information to those about. No. They get swapped. Yeah, well, yeah. Like but then they're not breaking the law. Because, because that's treason. You can't, you're, you're, you right. can't spy on your own citizens, but you right. can get another yeah. special relationship yeah. and then do another. You can do that. I don't know. So that's just my, that's just my fault. What do you think? Um, sorry, I was thinking about the road. You're <laughs> thinking things. about them catching the train. But, but I, but can I, can I, can yeah. I, I think, I think the, the thing with Ed uh, uh, Petty Bone and uh, Lauren Southern and Martin Selman, right? yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. I think it's the uh, Austrian boyfriend yeah. of Lauren Southern, yeah. and they yeah. formed the Generation Identity Group. The reason they've been banned for a period of time is. Uh, I think it's just that the left-wing activists have spotted them and crossed them out to the um, authorities and said, we've seen what these people are up to. Yeah. <laughs> it's, not that, it's not that they're being surveilled, actually. I think it's just that they're, 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 yeah, they're, they're being, yeah, it's just, it's just a, a turf war between left-wing activists who mouth them out. Although, I know, I, 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 I did I recall a while ago, though, Sean, that you're, you're linked to the traditional British group. They did entertain Generation Identity when they first started. They did, country. yes. So, um, <laughs> but I don't think anybody's being surveilled. I don't know the traditional British group are being surveilled or anybody else is being surveilled. I literally think they don't care less yeah. until some left-wing agitator says, look, here's a reason to block these people. Yeah. And that it's not, Theresa May is not there reading rap lyrics and saying this American rap who said something homophobic five years ago, we're not letting him in. Like, I think the point just been let in just recently, you know, uh, and he seemed to blame Theresa May because it was, she, wrote, she signed a letter by me or whatever. It's just, they're just reacting to uh, left-wing agitators drawing these people to their attention. And but uh, in the US, for example, antiwar.com, uh, uh, just in Raimondo and so on, they were <coughs> under surveillance efforts at some point by, by the government without being flagged up by uh, by activity. Our government or yeah. no, no, the the US 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 US. US. John? In the interest of inclusivity, the following people will be excluded. <laughs> yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I was thinking that when Sean was coming out with his thing. Yeah. We're going to stop you from speaking because we're interested in diversity. Yes. yes. <laughs> I, thought was, uh, I thought that was rather. Well, that's what they do, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, there's a paradox there. Well, we, well, shall we, we, shall we end it now and uh, continue yeah, yeah, it later on? Thank you very much indeed for coming. Thank you very much.